Thank you very much. Please be seated. It's great to be here. What a privilege. What a pleasure. It's, um, it's, always, a, a, it's always a great time when Sally and I find our way to this side of the country. Uh, thank you for your welcome. Thank you for your passion for Jesus that is so infectious. And thank you for the way in which you represent the Lord in all that you do. It's such an encouragement to us. We always go away feeling full, feeling blessed, feeling like we've received more than we've given. So thank you for that. It's a great place to come to. You often go to places where you feel like, wow, that was a lot. And uh, I hope they're going to pay us for it because... um, because, you know, it's, you know how that is. You know, there's some people that are just higher maintenance than others. And, um, <laughs> but it's just great. It's great to come here. And uh, it always feels as though you're blessing us. So thank you for that. Today, I want to just think about the beginning of a new year with you. I know that you're doing something of a focus um, in your studies over these first few days of the new year. And, as I was thinking about it, I was trying really to, to hear what God wanted to say to different types of people as he was leading them into this new adventure of 2020. And um, as, I, as I considered that, it seemed to me that, that uh, we needed to go back and look at the story of Mary and Martha Maybe help Martha get out of jail, because uh, she's she always kind of gets locked up, and someone throws away the key at the end of the preaching on this particular passage. You know what I mean? Because everybody said, "Well, you know, Mary's the one that you really, really need to be like." And you know, if you like Martha, then you know you either need to get saved or something. Um, but but I think that that's I think that that's unfortunate. I think that it's it's uh, unnecessary. Quite honestly, I think it might be a little unkind. Because if anybody entered your life at one of your low moments, you wouldn't really like it if that was the defining moment (laughs) that everybody used to understand you and to kind of weigh up your effect and influence on the world. And so today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start in this, in this passage here in Luke 10, which all of you have read, I'm sure, on numerous occasions. I'd like to start in Luke 10, and, um, and it's uh, going to be verse 38 that we look at right at the very end of the chapter. And then I'm going to jump over into John's Gospel and look at two other, two other places in the Scriptures that talk about Martha and Mary. The reason I'm doing this is because every story that you encounter in the Bible is a story that has what you would call an arc of narrative. And that arc of narrative begins with what you might call a call, and it finishes with what I'm going to call a completion. And it usually has, somewhere in the middle, something that you would probably call a challenge. Now, it doesn't matter which hero in the Old Testament you look at. It doesn't matter which person, male or female, you look at in the New Testament. If you follow the entirety of their story their story usually has at least three, these three components. If we were to, to take a kind of panoramic view of your life so far, it would have several cycles in which you heard the call of the Lord and you saw a completion of that call in your life to some extent. Of course, we're all waiting for the great completion when Jesus returns, but, but there are seasons and cycles in our life that begin with a sense of calling, that begin with 
an engagement with the Lord where he's speaking directly to us. We know that it's him. We can hear his voice. He may be communicating in ways that are not audible, but nevertheless, he's speaking to us directly. And we know that that call will end in a completion. But as Ryan suggested earlier, there is along the way something that we would call a trial. There is along the way something that we might call a test. There is along the way something that will challenge even the very roots of the calling that we feel that we have in the short or the long term. It's when you understand this arc of narrative that you begin to understand, I think, what Paul refers to when he speaks about the whole counsel of God. How is it? How is it that God engages with us, his children? How is it that God will interact with us through the days and months and years of our life? And how can we predict the pattern of our life as we walk with Jesus? There are fully predictable patterns to the way in which God engages with our life if you read the stories of the people of Scripture. They all have the same picture or pattern. It could be be Abraham and Sarah. You hear their call, you see their challenge, and you're very clear about the completion. It may be Moses, you hear the call, you feel the gut-wrenching challenges that he faces, and you see the completion as he readies the people to go into the promised land. You hear the call that is echoing from the heart of Ruth when she says to her mother-in-law that she'll never leave her, that they are deeply connected bone on bone. You see the challenges that they face as famine sweeps through the land and they have to find a way of, of surviving. And you see this amazing completion story where she is one of the grandparents of the great king David. Amazing. I mean, we could go through literally every character in the Old and the New Testament, and it would have the same pattern. And so if we, if we just pull out one episode from the story of Mary and Martha and say, okay, well, there's some really important things. There. Of course, there are important things there. But we don't get the full story. So today we're going to have a go at that. You, you all in for it? Yeah, ready? Okay, let's have a go. So let's, um, that's it, I'll just make sure I click the pen so it doesn't dry out. There's a demon assigned to pens and whiteboards. <laughs> I've, been, I've been fighting him most of my ministry. So Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her... Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. Now this is an amazing story. Luke, of all of the gospel writers, gives us an insight into the way that Jesus interacts with women. He's really amazingly insightful in helping us understand how Jesus works with different people and different genders and and different life situations. Here Here is a household overseen 
by a woman called Martha. Now, in the world of the Greco-Roman culture, largely the Roman Empire, and in this case, the corner of the Roman Empire that we know as Israel or the Holy Land, which the Romans called Palestine, this, this corner of the empire was very much like every other part of the empire when it came to the households that people lived in. In public life, it was very clear that the gender separation was very distinct and very unjust. Women were not simply second rate, they were subjugated to a terrible and marked degree. But what was interesting in every corner of the Roman Empire, and here we see it particularly expressed in Jewish culture, is that within the home, away from the public gaze, the gender balance was in many ways reordered. And very often, the way that the home was organized was that a woman led it. Do you notice the way that Luke describes this situation? He came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. It's her home. She's in charge. She's the boss, and she gets to say who comes or who goes. Now, that's very interesting, isn't it? And, of course, is reflected <clears throat> in many of the things that we encounter in the New Testament. And it's really only when the church has kind of crested the event horizon of the institutions of the Roman Empire that Paul and other writers of the New Testament have to say, do you know what? We probably need not to cause persecution to come on the church by the freedom that we know within our households to be expressed in the public arena, because if we do, it's probably going to end in the death of all of us. Paul even says that in Titus, that, that he's particularly concerned at that stage in his life, this is late in the 60s AD, that, that the church is going to end up with a reputation that's just going to attract more and more persecution. In fact, even in those uh, little conversations that he's having with these individuals like Titus and Timothy, he says, you know, really encourage the women to lead their homes. And the word that he uses there for lead is the word tyrant. <laughs> so it's not like, you know, they're kind of shrinking violets in any way. He's fully expecting them to fully rule their homes. So that's just a kind of a sociological thing that might be interesting for some of you who think about these, uh, these issues both now and then. So here's Martha. She's in charge of the household. And we know that Mary is part of that household. And we know that Lazarus, who we'll meet in a moment, not in a way that we would normally meet somebody, but uh, Lazarus is also part of that household and is, from the public perspective, seen as the titular head of the household in the public arena. But it's quite obvious who's in charge once the doors are closed. Martha is busy getting everything ready. There are men and women, we're told by Luke at the beginning of chapter 8, there are men and women who orbit Jesus all the time. Jesus has largely left his ministry in Galilee. He has sent his 12 disciples out into the mission field of Galilee to kind of do a sweeping up operation. And when they come back, there are so many people following them that they don't even have time to eat. Just at that same moment, they hear the news that John the Baptist has been executed in prison. Jesus takes the opportunity to say to his immediate followers, 
the people that we would know as the Twelve, he says, we need to retreat. And so via various different adventures like the feeding of the 5,000 and walking on water, Jesus and the disciples escape even the land of Israel and they go outside of the land and then come back into the land through the northern reaches of, of Israel. And soon after Peter has declared publicly that Jesus is not only the Messiah, something that he heard on the first day that he met Jesus when Andrew introduced him. Jesus is not only the Messiah, he is the Son of God. I'm sure that he had no idea how that would be possible even, but he knew in his heart that it was true. And Jesus, of course, said, it's not anybody that's revealed this to you, Peter, but my Father who's in heaven. And so you and I get to share the same name. You and I get to share the same set of keys. You and I get to share the same kingdom. And soon after that, Jesus takes the three leaders of the twelve with him to the Mount of Transfiguration. And there they are caught up into the regular retreats of Jesus. Now, we don't know on every occasion that the retreat was kind of completed with Jesus glowing bright like the sun. But on this occasion, he's transfigured and the cloud comes upon them. And the, and the voice of the Father speaks out and Moses and Elijah come and speak with Jesus about his departure in Jerusalem. And this is the moment that ends the first phase of the ministry of Jesus and opens up the last phase. Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration with his face fixed on his destination. For the joy set before him, he was prepared to endure even the torture of the cross. The joy of you and I gathering here this morning. The joy of a family gathered into the Father's house after the day of resurrection. He saw all of this and decided it was worth it. And so, having set his face towards Jerusalem, Jesus begins to move into the region that we would know as Judea, the ancient land of Judah. And as he's making his way progressively, determinedly towards Jerusalem, he comes to Bethany. Maybe multiple times he comes to this little village, village that's still there today. It bears the name of Lazarus. And so here, Jesus would return from time to time, and it may well be that this was his headquarters for his ministry in this region, a bit like Peter's home was the headquarters up in Galilee. And here's Jesus entering the home, perhaps for the first time. And Martha's welcomed him, and Mary is sitting at his feet. There is, of course, a clear distinction in the personality type that we see in Martha and Mary. Martha is most definitely the activist. Would you not say? If you looked at Mary, you would definitely say that Mary was the contemplative. Yeah? I mean, that's not deep exposition. It's just what they're doing. One's an activist. One's a contemplative. And Jesus says, only one thing is necessary. There's only one thing that's necessary. Now, is it that Martha is a contemplative? No, I don't think so. By the time we get to the end of the story... Martha has not become a contemplative. The one thing that is necessary is what Mary is actually doing in her contemplation, which is focusing on Jesus. The one thing that's needed, Martha, 
is what Mary is doing. Forget her behavior, just think about her focus. Her focus is me. Now, there's lots of Marthas here. And you kind of worry when we pick up this passage because you think, it's going to be a tough morning for me. (laughs) There's lots of Marys here and you think, I'm going to go out of church with that lovely glow, knowing that I'm slightly better, not a lot better, (laughs) but you know, slightly better than most people. But of course... There's something slightly more complex to it than that. God designed you with a personality type. We're not intended to be the same kinds of people, either here or in heaven. We know that God has an amazing capacity for variety. Just look at the world. Look at the faces in this room. Look at the flowers that you'll see emerging in the flower beds. Just think of any expression of God's creativity and you see amazing variety. So clearly, God does not intend for us all to be of one personality type. God wants to meet you in the personality type that you are. And of course, it's going to be a lot easier for him to meet you in the personality type that you are if you simply take the advice of Jesus at the beginning of this story. Focus on me. Focus on me. And then you'll find that your personality type is exactly what it is that I can use to bless other people and is exactly the personality type that will help you maintain a relationship with me and stay close to me. So let's look at another passage. My, uh, my iPad's been a bit on the fritz recently, and uh, I'm hoping that it's going to be okay. Last Sunday, it just gave up the ghost altogether, so I don't quite know what that's about. So let's, uh, let's look at John 11. Let's look at John 11. And we're going to have to do a bit of reading here. So I'm going to read quite a large portion of John 11 because we have to kind of get a hold of what it is that's going on here. Uh, Jesus has heard the news that uh, Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, is sick. And... um, It's obviously a serious sickness, otherwise the the news wouldn't have been sent to him. And he's some distance from Bethany. He's doing work in the area of the Jordan. He's down in the southern part of the land of Israel, just continuing and conducting his ministry as you would expect him to do. He hears the news and he says to the disciples, I think we're going to just stay a few more days. Now, Lazarus was a really close friend, and he's in real need. It would have been like Peter, at the beginning of the story, asking Jesus to come and help, and then Jesus saying, yeah, I'll come in a little while. It's just like, it's an uncharacteristic thing. It doesn't sound like Jesus. There must be something else going on. Well, they get to Bethany... After the delay, Lazarus is dead. He's been in the grave four days already. And of course, the household is devastated. Martha is the leader of the household, but the one who would hold, if you like, the purse strings would be the male head of the household. And often this put women in real vulnerability. Often it meant that they were prey to other unscrupulous people. And it meant that they were 
pushed to the margins of society and found themselves in poverty and penury. That's why the injunction of Scripture, both in the Old and the New Testament, is to take care of the widows and the orphans. And so this is an enormously serious thing that's happened to this household. And Jesus arrives, and we pick up the story in verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Now, I don't know whether you know the differentiation in personality type that is defined by the thinker, but it goes all the way back to Jung, and you find it in Myers-Briggs analyses of personality types. But I mean, if ever there was a thinker in the Bible, it's Martha. I mean, her brother's just died. Devastation has come to her household. And she's got theological questions. <laughs> it's really fascinating, isn't it? Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And you're thinking, well, you know, it's a pretty good start, but it would have been nice to say hi. <laughs> but she's right in there, you know. She's not, you know, she's just, we know what she's like. There's a little bit of back pressure in everything that she does. Yeah, so it's all going to come out a little bit quicker and a little bit harder than maybe she even wants it. Don't you love people like Martha? I tell you what, without Martha's, we wouldn't get a lot done. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Now, you'd have thought that Jesus would have said, yeah, I'm really sorry that I couldn't make it in time. It's terrible news about Lazarus. But, but Jesus knows how to engage a thinker. Jesus knows how to engage you, a thinker. Now let's just make sure that we all understand who are the thinkers. It's 50% of the population. Now, the, the, the Myers-Briggs kind of organization and movement around the world for the last 20 or so years have been conducting surveys on every continent of the planet. And there are millions of returns and millions of people who've been surveyed. And with all of the millions of people in all of the countries in the world, or on all of the continents of the planet, it comes back every time that there are 50% extroverts in the world, 50% introverts in the world, there are 50% thinkers in the world and 50% feelers in the world. Now, introvert and extrovert, there's no gender bias at all. But with thinker and feeler, it's a bit different. It is 50% of the population, but it's 70% of the men who are thinkers and 30% who are feelers. And 70% of the women who are feelers, and 30% who are the thinkers. Now, if you're a woman thinker here this morning, you know what it's like for Martha. You end up being the one who organizes stuff, but you also feel like you're the one who's different to all of the other women, 
And so maybe doesn't get included in the same way that everybody else gets included. Maybe during that mysterious moment when all the girls go to the bathroom together, <laughs> you don't get invited. <laughs> now, I'm a man. I've been watching this the whole of my life. <laughs> to this day, I have no idea what's happening. I don't know what's going on in there. I don't know why it's taking so long. Nobody's prepared to share with me what's happening in there. But wherever I go in the world, it happens. But if you're the thinker female, you're not quite as included as others. And maybe that's true of Martha as well. In the same way, if you're the feeler guy, maybe, you know, everybody else wants to talk about the ball game and the team, the stock market and politics, and the last interesting book that they read. And you try to do the same thing too. Whereas really, you're not really interested. You'd much more talk about more important things like, you know, how people are coping and <laughs> managing in the world that they live in and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, is, this, is it anybody getting connected with here? Is anybody, yeah? I hope I'm not excluding anybody here in this conversation. So let's get back to Martha. Martha is a, as clear as you'll ever meet one, a thinker. She's an activist and a thinker. She's probably an extrovert because she's, you know, she doesn't kind of give you any indication that she's an introvert. And she comes to Jesus full bore, full on, and Jesus gives her amazing, amazing insight. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again at the resurrection at the last day. I wasn't talking about that. Uh, it's not included in the text, but you can kind of pick it up, can't you? I know that. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you know how many people in the whole of the Bible would have loved to have been there the day that that revelation was given? It was given to Martha. Isn't that cool? Isn't that great? Hey, Marthas, you got that revelation. <laughs> yeah? You're awesome too. It's not just Mary. You're awesome. He who believes in me, even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And here's the thing. What Jesus does here, he brings Martha in with the invitation for a thinker's conversation. But the thing about a thinker's conversation is it can all be out here. It can all be concepts and principles. It can all be theology and thought. At some point, all of that thinking has to land in belief, which is an internal reality that is beyond the thought process. It's an internal embracing of truth. Yeah, it may well be that you've established truth with your clever minds. But belief is not something that you simply give mental assent to. Belief, belief is the change of the inner life to embrace something as a certainty because you've heard the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And she's heard. And Jesus says, okay, activist, I know how clever you are. Is your heart turned 
towards me? Do you believe I, I, I am the resurrection and the life? It's a focus on me, Martha. Remember? You need to focus on me. Do you believe this? She says, yes, Lord. You know I believe. You're the Messiah and the Son of God. She says exactly the same thing that the Apostle Peter says. Isn't that cool? And that's what Martha the thinker needed in the midst of the most terrible grief. So shall we carry on with the story? Let's just have a look. It's great fun, isn't it? You, I know you know the story, but it's almost like you don't. <laughs> Verse 28. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at a place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been in with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Martha was eye to eye. Mary was at his feet. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would have died, would not have died. Exactly the same words as Martha, but because of her posture and because of the way that she says it, it's so obvious that she's a different kind of person. Jesus doesn't kind of pick her up and say, I'm the resurrection and the life, Mary. Get it together. (laughs) He doesn't even say, dry your eyes. It'll all be better tomorrow. (coughs) Now, if you're a feeler, and if you're a woman, every chance that you are, If you're a feeler, what is it that Jesus does when you're in most need of revelation? Let's look. Verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit. I'm troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take the stone away. Now, if you're a feeler, this is what Jesus does. He comes and stands in the midst of your overwhelming emotion. And he meets you there. And he joins you there. And he laughs if you're laughing. And he weeps if you're weeping. And is it a lesser revelation than the one he gave to Martha? Well, the thinkers say, yeah, obviously it is. (laughs) I mean, some of them are actually nodding, going, yeah, it is a lesser revelation. I can see you. I can see you. You're not even meaning to do it. Well, I mean... Stupid. I mean, obviously, 
way better to be Martha at this point. <laughs> but if you're Mary, is it a lesser revelation that the Son of God comes and stands with you and weeps with you? Of course it isn't. But look what he does with Mary. Where have you laid him? Mary, along with the others, take Jesus to the grave. Jesus is wanting to meet Mary in her grief. But he wants to lead her to a place where she'll see him as the re resurrection and the life. Martha already believes it. Mary, she doesn't need to hear it so much as see it. And so here's Jesus at the tomb. Move away the stone. <laughs> Martha's obviously heard what's going on. Verse 38. Oh, sorry, verse 39. Take away the stone, Jesus said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. For he's been in there four days. I mean, again, classic, isn't it? I mean, it's going to stink, Jesus. It's going to be real. I hope you're standing back. And Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, Martha, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, Mary and Martha, that they may believe that you sent me. When he'd said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And when he came out, he said to those that were standing near him, Set him free from the bandages. Now there's a whole nother sermon right there. Because so many of us have been resurrected to new life. But we still need the disciples around us to set us free from the grave clothes that we still carry. But maybe we'll do that sermon another day. Right now, let's just think about Mary and Martha, because Jesus has engaged with them in an entirely different way, hasn't he? And so the end of the story comes in chapter 12 of John. And if you're going to get the full story, you probably need to look at Matthew 26 as well. Because what we have here is a story that... When we have all of the Gospels, and remember when John was writing his Gospel, he knew that the other Gospels had been circulating and they knew these stories of Jesus. Jesus was having dinner in the home of a man called Simon the leper. Probably a man who'd been healed by Jesus. But look how the, how the setup is described. Because it's really quite unusual. Six days before the Passover, this is John 12, 1, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Among those at the table with him would suggest that it's not Lazarus's table. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair 
and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Judas Iscariot was upset, so were the other disciples. A pint of pure nard, just in today's terms, would be, I mean, it's hard to estimate, but tens of thousands of dollars. A similar amount was given by the king of Saudi Arabia to Diana on her marriage to Prince Charles. And it was such an incredibly expensive gift that they didn't feel that they could receive it. Hugely expensive gift. It was probably her dowry left to her by her parents that would be the basis of her new life in the future. But she poured it all out. All of her future, all of her security, all of her hopes and dreams, she poured it all out on Jesus. But Martha is leading in another person's house. Martha served. That's just New Testament code for Martha's in charge. It's just a real short sentence, but that's basically what it's saying. Martha served. Lazarus is there. He's reclining at the table. Simon's obviously the guy whose house it is in. Martha's in charge in somebody else's house. Her leadership is so amazing that now she is a public, a public Leader. Yeah? And Mary has gone from quietly, contemplatively sitting at the feet of Jesus to doing something that represents her love for Jesus. Now... Mary has come out into the open and is a public worshipper. Yeah? Something's happened to both of them. And it's the ministry of Jesus to them that's changed them. The doer has had to learn to be the beer. And the beer has had to learn to be a doer. This year, the Lord will work in you, Martha or Mary, or whatever the male version of that is. And as he works in you, He will be seeking to balance you and grow you and strengthen and make you a fuller expression of what it is that you've been called to be. And as he does that, he'll meet you precisely where you are and minister to you in precisely the way that you need him to minister to you. Whether you're a thinker or a feeler, whether you're an activist or a contemplative, Jesus, beyond everyone else, knows how to meet you where you are. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to hand the mic over.